Hello and welcome to today's lecture on Richard de Souza Square Prix. Richard de Souza was a well-known Sri Lankan journalist, author, human rights activist, actor and poet who was abducted and murdered on 18 February 1990. So the lesson objective for today is to study his Square Prix in terms of his use of animal imagery in his political satires. So first of all, we will look at his poem, Animal Crackers. In Animal Crackers, the poet creatively portrays a picture of the political chaos and ethnic conflict uh, in Sri Lanka, leading up to the escalation of violence in July 1983. By predominantly exploring animal imagery in order to represent individuals and various political groups. This deliberate symbolism concerning animals and humans can be perceived to a certain extent as dehumanizing. We can interpret that one, that one of the reasons why De Souza engages in such symbols is to basically convey an authentic sense concerning the potential of humans towards committing acts of brutality and violence. So when we talk about this poem, one of the very first things that we have to discuss is about the title of this poem, Animal Crackers. So let's try to deconstruct the title first. First of all, there is a reference to animals in the poem. And these animals are the lion, the tiger, the elephant, and the jackal, who symbolically allude to certain ethnic groups, political parties, social institutions, etc. And then we have the word crackers. According to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, a big cracker is a noun, and the meaning of this is basically one that cracks a big. That can also be one who adopts and apply or applies an authoritative, tyrannical, or threatening approach or policy. So if we go by the first definition, that is crackers along with animals, we can interpret that Vizoisa might have used the word crackers in a way to convey the assumption of those who manipulate, control, and wield power over animals at a circus, for example. So the fact that animals can actually represent some ethnic groups in Sri Lanka uh, can give the assumption that these groups might be controlled by misguided assumptions, powerful groups of social institutions, and also perhaps uh, driven by their own internalized beliefs. And if we go to the poem, I will share the poem with you. Here it says that animal crackers and within brackets, it says for Dimitri when he is old enough to understand. So it is said that this poem is written for Dimitri when he's old enough to understand. So that can connotate the assumption that this is a young child who evidently doesn't understand about communal violence, the politics of the ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka and so forth. So if you go to the poem and read the first stanza, it says, draw me a lion. So I set my pen to work produce a lazy kindly beast, color it yellow. Does it bite? Sometimes, but only when it's angry. If you pull its tail or say that it is just another cat. But for the most part, indolent, beatable, basking in the sun of ancient pride. So it is very interesting it, what, what is said in the poem in terms of what would make a lion bite right when it's angry or if you pull its, pull its tail and say that it is just another cat so the lion would otherwise be a lazy kindly beast who would bask in the sun of ancient pride this refers to the glory significance and historical value placed by the sinhalese with regard to their identity so the notion here is that uh, the proud Sinhalese will not tolerate being provoked. However, this is not really a critique of nationalism or patriotism, considering the context in which this poem was written, right? 
So the context is, of course, the ethnic violence, which was prevalent during the 1980s in Sri Lanka. Uh, and we can interpret it as the poem's attempt as the poets attempt to indicate a blind sense of pride and a sense of superiority, which has been internalized by Sinhalese in a very nuanced manner. So we can even interpret it as an ironical jab on the powerful institutions and groups which exploit this pride of, of Sinhalese for nefarious, for various nefarious purposes. And then if we go to the poem, within brackets in the poem, it says, outside the sunlight seems a trifle dulled and there's a distant roaring like a pride of lions cross at being awakened from long deep sleep. So the lions being awakened can be a reference to the riots, uh, the snowballing escalation of violence of the oncoming disaster and devastation leading up to the 1983 riots in Sri Lanka. So here we can even say that a poetic technique has been incorporated by Zoisa here. And we can identify that as foreshadowing, which has been incorporated by the poet to convey that something ominous or foreboding is about to take place. So if you read about the historical context, you know that during the time some armed soldiers were ambushed and killed by the LTTE in Jaffna. So this led to anti-Tamil rioters attacking the civilian Tamils, which led to an island-wide commotion that was backed by certain political figures, certain political and authoritative figures. So the poet may be implying that incident, showing that somehow, some way or the other, uh, the lions have arisen from their long, deep sleep. Right, And then uh, in the poem, it says, then draw me a tiger vision of a beast compounded by Jim Corbett's yards and Blake stalks through the mind, blazing nature's warning, black bars on gold. So the reference to the tiger is an allusion to the LTTE. Uh, and then the reference to Jim Corbett is uh, the reference to the actual Jim Corbett, who was an explorer, hunter, and writer who uh, wrote about the wildlife in India. And then the reference to Blake is, of course, the reference to the romantic poet, the romantic British poet, William Blake, stalks through the mind, blazing nature's warning. So the term, uh, the words here, the blazing nature's warning is important, right? So, because it can refer to the duplicity or the double side of nature, which is evident here. For an example, uh, the calm exterior as opposed to the inner turmoil. They are, therein we can see the duplicity, right? And then uh, he continues on to say, draw, you turn and draw the gun on me, as if to show that three-year-olds understand force majeure, and as you pull the silly plastic trigger, all hell breaks loose. Quite suddenly, the sky. Quite suddenly, the sky uh, is full of smoke and orange stripes of flame. So the use of the childish action of drawing the plastic trigger is very important, right? Because it can be filled with impact in terms of conveying the gravity of the violence, horror, brutality, and turmoil during the time. Uh, and here, the reference to black bars on gold is also important. So this can be a use of rich visual imagery to indicate the tiger stripes uh, blazed as black bars on gold, right? And again, this action of pulling the plastic trigger, as I said earlier, it's very significant because this act of innocent mimicry is merely a is actually a mimicry of the terror which uh, terror and devastation that takes place right and then in block capitals we see uh, the poets saying but here there are no tigers here there are only lions right so this is also important first of all the orange stripes of flame here that is also important because it can be symbolic it can refer to the national flag, the Sri Lankan national flag. 
So the orange stripe in the flag represent the Tamil community, right? And the, the block capitals here is also important, but here there are no, no tigers. Here there are only lions because this can be perhaps a reference to propaganda, which was used to motivate the mobs to attack all Tamils without any sense of discrimination. And then the poet continues on to say, and their jackals run panting, rabbit in the roaring sway, infecting all with madness as they pass, while my lord, the elephant sways in his shaded arbor, wrinkles his ancient brows and wonders if did he venture out to quell this jungle tide of rising flame he'd burn his tender feet so the reference to uh, jackals here can be the reference to the involvement of the government mobs who were uh, who may have given the information to these mobs because they were uncontrollable. These mobs are uncontrollable and they knew where the Tamils lived, right? And the reference to my lord here is an allusion to J.R. Jayavarthana and the reference to elephant is a reference to the United National Party and the elephant, uh, De Soisa is actually giving a description down in the bottom of the poem. He says that, uh, so he says that it is actually not in this copy I'm sharing with you. The elephant is the party symbol of the ruling United National Party, right? So, okay, it's actually here. So basically, um, the animal imagery, which De Soiza is incorporating in this poem, we can say that it is obviously predictable to a Sri Lankan audience, but it might be, uh, used to cater to the larger audience at large as well. Uh, the fact that uh, the, these animal imageries are incorporated, though it's predictable for a local audience, uh, it, might, it might not be the case for uh, a, la a larger audience, right? A larger uh, non-international audience. So therefore, um, that might be the why he's also giving an author's note as well. And then if we continue on to the poem, it says, um, the elephant sways in his shaded arbor. So that is also important, right? Because, uh, because uh, it gives the sense of the government's lack of involvement to stop the quelling violence. Uh, so that is very satirically depicted in this poem, especially when the poet says, Put down that gun if you do and and you're good. I'll draw a picture of an elephant, a curious beast that you must understand, right? And then he says, don't look out the window. So we see a capitalized, uh, we see that this is capitalized, bolded and in imperative. So this is perhaps a caution uh, to the people to avoid intervention so that when intervention is avoided, the disaster can actually take place, right? And uh, the next few, the next few uh, lines, just a party down the lane, a bonfire and some fireworks, they're burning. No, not a tiger, just some silly cat. So this promotes the habit of turning a blind eye towards the escalating violence, right? Because it says, no, not a tiger, just some silly cat. So this is perhaps referring uh, to how uh, people, people are promoted to be ignorant, right? Promoting, as a way of promoting ignorance, as a way of concealing the actual horror that takes place, the uh, loss of lives, the destruction, the, uh, the horror, the brutality, right? So perhaps Desoisa here is subtly trying to implicate journalists as well, journalists and their unethical practices, the unethical practices of bad journalism in terms of uh, journalists who promoted government propaganda, uh, which was given a central place, right? So instead of reporting what is factual, instead of being objective, uh, what was given predominance by the media was government propaganda, which is of course, as Desoisa sees, is a practice of bad journalism, right? So this is something which again actually took place. 
Um, and then from there, I would like to go to his next poem, Birds, Beasts and Relatives. Uh, so in this poem, Birds, Beasts and Relatives, you can see how Richard de Souza contextualizes human civilization and savagery, along with the violence, horror, and ethnic disharmony within the socio-political context of Sri Lanka during the 1980s. And de Souza realizes this by engaging in this political satire by using animal imagery. And this is something you can actually frequently see in De Souza's work. So we just observe this practice of uh, using animal imagery in the political satire in the poem Animal Crackers as well, right? So let's study in depth how he does this in birds, beasts, and relatives as well. So he starts with saying, we saw three leopards and a bear, four herds of elephants, a pair of nesting paradise fly, fly catchers and hordes of teal in bigger batches. So here he's first of all establishing the setting of this poem. The setting of this poem is a wildlife park which remains unnamed throughout the entire poem. So the poet visits the wildlife park maybe as a member of a group safari right and names several sites from wildlife which he perceives as four herds of elephants, a pair of nesting paradise uh, flycatchers, and a horde of teal in bigger batches. And then he says, then they said, the time before, it has been quite a while, you know, since last I visited the park, the passing ears have left their mark. So it is here also suggested that it has been a while since the poet has visited the place, right? And then in the next tensa, he says, I cannot get much pleasure now identifying bull or crow, a bull or cow, a quarter mile across the plain, revisiting again, again. But he says that he cannot derive any thrill or satisfaction from watching wildlife anymore, right? So that means he cannot attain any sense of gratification by seeing the violence between animals anymore. So why is that? He explains the reasons as to why in the next few stanzas, he says, a donkey, hoping other species like man, return to their own faces. For once you've seen the man on the kill, the spotted hunter fails to thrill. So it is because the human's threshold for violence that goes beyond that of violence, according to Visoisa, right? So therefore, according to Visoisa, once you encounter human mediated violence, the satisfaction, the gratification and the pleasure you derive from it becomes so much that watching wildlife by going on a safari cannot give you that same sense of thrill, excitement and enthusiasm anymore, right? And then he continues on to say, yes, man's a splendid predatory beasts with a fine hereditary chauvinistic sense of smell and hunters I he claims can tell the subtle shades of class or race that doom the quarry to the chase. So though he's indicating that there are so many other variables when it comes to human mediated violence and discrimination, uh, such as the subtle or very minute differences of class and race and ethnicity, these can be indicative of class dynamics, racial and ethnic discrimination, and so many other variables which can be connected to them as well. Uh, so such as religion, education, etc. right? And then he continues on to say, but man, uh, quite unlike beasts in lots, for of instance, can change his pot spots. So humans, despite their parallels to beasts in terms of demonstrating their instincts to commit violence, horror, and other atrocious deeds can be quite unlike other beasts in terms of how often they change their spots, according to the Soisa. So that is, that we can interpret is, uh, can be indicative of how men or humans 
can change their affinities depending on the changing situation or context. So for an example, depending on the changing social political situation in the country, the people can change their affinity, the people can change their affiliation, right? So that is something common you see not only in Sri Lanka, but also in so many other countries. So this can be indicative of a different type of violence actually, right? Because this does not necessarily indicate physical violence but maybe a more culturally mediated violence, maybe in terms of violating ethics, maybe in terms of violating morals uh, or cultural values even, right? And then he uh, continues on to say, all mass adapt as camouflage, mass adapt at camouflage. So committing on the chameleon-like nature of man here, for better than the whole menage at molting and the slowing skin or just discreetly blending in. So this can perhaps be a satirical comment on the manipulative and deceptive nature of man. Uh, and this is characteristically something we can uniquely or distinctively identify with man, identify with only humans, but not any other beasts, right? And then he continues on to say, with concrete jungle leaf blade. So this can be a reference to De Souza's contemporary Sri Lankan society where people live. And that is the reason why the word concrete is used here, along with the word jungle and then leafy blade. So this is perhaps we can interpret it as uh, De Souza's attempts to draw parallels between the actual jungle and the modern society of his contemporary context to demonstrate to what extent it also reflects the wilderness, hostility and danger that you can find lurking within the actual jungle. And then he continues on to say, with a uh, concrete jungle leafy glade creative use of light and shade to hide the forbidden private parts. So this is also very important, right? So again, the reference to the use of light and shade in a creative, uh, in a creative manner can perhaps be a reference to the manipulative manner uh, in which the forbidden private parts are concealed. This can be a reference to perhaps the ulterior agendas, motives and goals as to why people or humans camouflage themselves. And then he continues on to say, so let us exercise what arts we, can, we have and join the savage herd, cry out for blood and spread the word. So here you can see a deliberate play on words, how there is no other choice but to join this savage herd who is crying out for blood. This is maybe a reference to the mobs who attack, spread hostility, violence, horror, perpetuate hatred, ethnic intolerance and discrimination. So the reference to the herd, the word herd here is also important because you see how De Souza has deliberately dehumanized them and their violent actions. This emphasizes the savagery, hostility, and violence for the purposes of depicting that this is actually not humane behavior, right? So that is the reason why De Souza is using animalistic images throughout his poems to refer to humans and their actions. And then he ends the poem by saying, let nature do uh, the worst it can, best query for mankind is man. So this is actually a reference to intertextuality. And this is an intertextual reference to the Augustan poet Alexander Pope's essay on man, where he says, the proper study of mankind is man. So there we, there we can conclude our lecture on Richard de Soyce's poetry in terms of looking at the animal imagery in his political satires. Thank you so much for listening.